This happened when I was in elementary school, a long time ago. I used to be part of this school club called Forestry School. They held lots of events for kids, and this experience takes place when I was in year six. They had this one event, which was a two-night trip to stay out in the elements. We would be sleeping out in the forest in the shade of the mountains, in a place called the Something Boys Nature House, something like that, I can't remember at the moment. It seemed really fun at the time though. All us kids pitched in to make dinner that evening. It was really great, and it didn't feel like a chore at all. It was a curry, and it tasted amazing. After dinner was over, we had a great time just sat around the campfire. It was a really chill night. But only up until that point, things went downhill after that. The teacher, or leader, if you will, of the forestry school event told us kids that we would have to take an uphill walk to the dormitory we would be staying in that night. I think he said it was going to be like a 300 meter climb, and that made a few of us kids grumble a little. I think that one of the teachers picked up on this and tried to make the uphill walk a little bit more fun by saying it would be a kind of spooky walk, and we should see it as a test of our collective courage to walk up the hill through the forest in the dark. The plan was for us kids to pair up and walk with flashlights. I guess this would allow the teachers to keep attendance of us by headcount. Although it was phrased as a kind of spooky walk, there were no hidden surprises. You know, no one was going to jump out on us wearing any creepy costumes or make any wailing sounds in the woods. We had our flashlights in hand and we were ready to be on our way. There were no streetlights that far out in the woods. I heard from my brother that they did this before and some of the kids in his group found it pretty scary, so I was looking forward to it. The teachers on the trip were stood at different points on opposite sides of the road in approximately equal intervals just in case the students got lost or had any issues. We were lined up by surnames and I was right at the back because my surname starts with W. I found out that because we had an odd number of students on the trip that I would be doing the creepy walk alone. The teachers thought that I wouldn't mind since I was a little older than some of the other kids but to be honest, I would have preferred to have been buddied up with someone. And when I get to the end of my experience, I think you'll understand why that would have been better than going alone. I didn't know why I couldn't be in a three instead of being alone. Maybe that was offered to me and I wasn't paying attention, or maybe my teacher didn't think of it. One good thing was, as soon as I passed the first of the six teachers at the start of the route, he would follow on behind. The one thing that was annoying was the fact that I had to wait like a good five minutes after the last pair before I could start walking. I had to wait as soon as they went up around a right hand turn and out of sight about 50 meters ahead. I walked along the path swinging my flashlight left to right going over the trees and the bushes. It was pretty creepy. It felt like I was the only person out there in the woods that night despite the fact that I knew I wasn't. After a while, I saw the first teacher at the first curve coming up. I gave him a little nod. As soon as I climbed that right curve, I noticed that there was a sharp incline. There was a guardrail to the left, and beyond that guardrail were lots of trees. I saw another teacher just stood beyond the guardrail. I couldn't really see the teacher's face very well due to how dark it was, and I didn't want to shine my flashlight in his face because I know that hurts your eyes. I didn't recognize that teacher at first, but that wasn't unusual. I didn't know all the teachers on this particular trip. This teacher was stood at the break in the guardrail. There looked to be a forest trail behind where he was stood. It looked like it was the path or the route we should walk down. I thought it was the way to go, so I headed towards him. The teacher started beckoning me to come with him, so I followed. He disappeared down the forest path, and I started behind him. But then I was suddenly stopped in my tracks. Someone behind me shouted my name and I froze. I suddenly felt an adult hand grab me on my shoulder and pull me backwards. I then heard running down the forest trail ahead of me as I was stopped. I turned to face whoever stopped me and it was the first teacher who was at the first curve. He had a very serious expression on his face. I asked him what was wrong but he didn't say a word, he just walked with me. 
away from that gap in the guardrail and towards the dormitory. He didn't exactly tell me what happened that night, and I spent that night thinking I had done something wrong. It wasn't until I was older that I realized the danger of the situation I was in. I think there are a couple of possibilities that could explain my experience, and I would like to ask you for your opinions on my theories. I might have seen some kind of spirit. Some kids I told about my experience said that they saw wilted flowers by the side of the road. Plus, if you think about it, the guardrail having a hole in it might have been caused by an accident at some point in time. It could have been a spirit jealous of the living, trying to lead me away. I don't know. The second and much more frightening option, in my opinion, is that there was a person out there in the woods that night. They might have been aware that there would be kids out there that night, because it was an annual event. I shudder to think what might have happened to me if the actual teacher wasn't behind me walking up that trail because I nearly went with a total stranger down a forest trail into the middle of the dark forest. I guess I'll never truly know the answer. This story takes place about four years ago. It was my wife, my dog, and myself. We were on the second day of an 80 kilometer hike in Northern Ontario. We set up camp on a point 750 meters into a lake, one way onto the point and one way off the point. We were hearing wolves since about 9 p.m., went to bed by 10, and the house were getting closer and closer. Then, one howled from right behind us on the trail down to the point. I got out of the tent and started making loads of noise in an attempt to scare it off. This usually works for bears, whom we've had loads of encounters with. I didn't see anything there and didn't hear anything either. I went back to bed and laid down, trying to act confident as to not upset my wife. That's when we both heard something outside of the tent. My dog was crazy quiet but shaking. I opened the tent to find a wolf staring at me from about 15 feet away. I grabbed the bear spray and took aim. I didn't use it, but I again started screaming at the wolf and took a few charges towards it. Again, this usually works when faced with a black bear if you have no escape. The wolf didn't really care that I was yelling at it. It kind of hung out for a few seconds then kind of very casually walked into the tree line, just far enough that I couldn't see it anymore. I built a fire between the tent and the bush and sat up all night, kept my headlamp on all night and had to listen to three or four wolves howl to each other all night about every 20 minutes. They were very close. I would estimate them to be within 50 yards. I'm sure they were here to come and grab my dog and at about 6 a.m. a bunch of them started howling together, way more than during the night. We waited until about 8 a.m., packed all our stuff and got out of there. We were 36 kilometers, and it took us two days to hike in. We hiked out in 6.5 hours. About 1.5 hours into our hike, the wolves started howling behind us again. They were following us. On the hike out, we saw a bear with two cubs. This would usually concern us a bit, but we just wanted to get the hell out of there. My wife lost all her toenails from the hike, and my poor dog got some serious anxiety about being in a tent. This is a very strange and mysterious story that I heard from my grandfather. He told me that he experienced all of this firsthand. My grandpa grew up in the mountains. All around his family home there are forests as far as the eye can see. 
I remember being out there as a child, and the trees seemed to tower over everything. Since he grew up in the mountains, he worked in the mountains. He spent a lot of his working life outdoors, so you can imagine he has more stories than the one I'm about to share with you. This one stayed with me the most, though. I think it's the creepiest, and I don't know how I'd react if it happened to me. Anyways, it happened like this. When he was out in the mountains, working, he said he heard this incredibly unusual noise. It sounded like a very low, croaky, crow-like call. I can imagine what that sounds like, and I hope you can too. After that weird low, crow call sound, he said he felt a presence, and he turned to face it, and it was at that point he saw a crow approaching him. It called and hopped a couple of steps, and then it repeated. It didn't seem to be frightened of my grandpa, and unlike most birds, it actually headed towards him rather than fleeing away from him. It slowly approached and stopped just before his feet. At that point, my grandfather remembered words the locals shared as gospel about encounters in the woods. They say, do not observe, provoke, or ignore their presence. I found the vagueness of that statement pretty chilling, but I guess that the underlying tone is that whatever is in front of you isn't really a crow. They say that when it's directly in front of you, you must shut your eyes and make sure you don't move a muscle. When it stops cawing, they say it's your chance to ask it for permission to pass. You won't get a reply, you will just have to wait until you believe that this strange creature has moved on. You should be able to hear it hop away and call that low, croaky call as it goes. Well, my grandfather, he says that he experienced the approaching of crows on a number of occasions, usually when he was working deep in the mountains. He would always follow the local rules, but over time he developed a sense of curiosity about what might happen if he broke the rules. He wondered if perhaps it was just a crow with a low call and he was looking like a bit of a fool by asking it for permission to pass. He thought of how legends from times gone by go on to be disproved in the modern age. Maybe this was nothing more than a local superstition. So one day my grandpa decided to open his eyes when the bird was right in front of him. And he opened his eyes to see a pitch black world. There was nothing but darkness in front of him. He could see everything clearly that morning, but now there was nothing but a void, a chilling sense of nothingness. I imagine it kind of looks like what it might be like inside of a black hole or something. He said that he was so disturbed by the lack of anything in the world that he said that he couldn't move. Then he had a sudden realization that he was seeing something he couldn't or shouldn't be seeing. And then as if there was a snap, his vision returned to him, and he was back in the woods beneath the morning rays of the sun. He was really grateful to be back, but he said for about a month after that encounter, he was in a state of living hell. He said that he would regularly wake up from fever dreams to see a towering shadow figure either enter his bedroom or be stood glaring at him from the foot of his bed. Every night, the same nightmare played out, and it made him terrified of sleep but he would always wake up at the moment he saw the entity. He struggled with his mental state, unable at points to realize if it was night or day, dream or reality, and just when he was at his wit's ends, the encounters with the shadow beings gradually ended. After he told me about his experience, he laughed and told me to make sure I follow the local rules when I'm out in the woods. Also, my grandma told me a story about a similar experience she had. There was no crow in her experience, just bodiless footsteps approaching her. And she just froze and shut her eyes. It's unclear to me if these entities are the same, but one thing is clear. There are things out there in the wild of nature that we cannot comprehend. A few months ago, 
My friend and I went to hike Pikes Peak near Colorado Springs. The hike up this mountain is literally marathon, with about 7,000 feet of vertical gain. And the general rule of thumb is that if you're not up and back down below the tree line by noon, then you are at risk of being struck by lightning. So we made the decision to hike the whole thing in one day by starting at 11 p.m. the night before. So we had rolled up to the trailhead at 10.30, only to find the parking lot completely empty, which felt very odd for a 14er trailhead on a Friday night in late summer. I had done nighttime hikes of other mountains, but the parking lot was usually at least half full at all times, especially in the late summer in Colorado. That made me feel a little uneasy, but I shrugged it off and we started the hike. We started off at a pretty good pace, getting about five miles in within the first few hours, and it was about 1 a.m. at this point. We're walking along a narrow part of the trail that has a large rock cropping out to the right of us. As we pass it, we hear a scraping noise followed by some rustling of bushes and then silence. That freaked me out a bit, but I told myself it was a deer and that we must have spooked him, and we continued along. For the next few miles, I kept hearing little noises off in the distance to our right. About an hour later at 2 a.m., we had just passed Bar Camp, which is about seven miles from the trailhead, still without seeing any other human being other than my friend. Even the campsite was deserted. Anyway, I'm walking along the trail about two to three meters ahead of my friend. When I look up a little, and see two glowing white circles floating in the darkness on the trail, about 15 meters ahead of me. My heart sunk, and I stopped dead in my tracks. My friend asked me why I'd stopped, and I told him to point his headlamp, which was brighter than mine up the trail. We saw that the two glowing orbs belonged to a mountain lion. At this point, I was just frozen, looking at him, thinking, crap, that is the last thing I want to see out here. He was quite aware of our presence as well, and stared at us for about 15 seconds, and then retreated into the darkness behind some trees. At this point, without saying a word, I take out a thing of bear mace and hand it to my friend, and we turn around on the spot and begin hiking back down the mountain at a very brisk pace. I was looking right down the trail, and my friend spent about 80% of the time walking back to back with me, so that it wouldn't jump scare us. We made it back down the trailhead at about 3.30, counted our blessings and went home. Overall, the hike was a very unsettling experience. Being deep in the forest, without coming across any other people, especially when you would expect to meet others, is uncomfortable, let alone being stalked by one of the most dangerous predators in North America. I know that most of the time, mountain lions don't attack humans, but I've been told that if you see a mountain lion, then they've been aware of your presence for a good while prior to that, and if they make their presence known to you, it's usually a warning. So I can only assume that all noises I heard that night were from the mountain lion stalking us. Also, the next day, we found out why we were alone on the trail. Earlier that day, an elderly man had had a heart attack and died on the trail, so the trail was closed, but we missed the memo since we got up there so late. I heard this story from a good friend of mine. He isn't the type to make stuff up. Way too serious of a guy, to be honest. Anyway, my friend works in forests. He tends the natural parks and woods. I guess you could say he's a bit like a park ranger. One day, when he was out in the woods with another park employee, he heard something slightly alarming. He said that he heard the sound of someone calling someone in a faint and distant voice. He and his co-workers stopped and stood in place and tried to listen a little closer to see 
if they could make out the words that were being said, or at least ascertain the direction the voice was coming from. When they paused and listened, my friend was shocked to hear that it sounded like someone was calling out to him. The voice was calling his name. Who could that be? He wondered. He was about to respond with a call of his own, but his colleague stopped him. His colleague raised an arm in the air and glared at my friend and slowly raised a finger to his mouth to indicate the universal be quiet gesture. And then his colleague spoke. That's what they call the caller. Most of the time it's just a phenomenon where you hear sounds and noises that sound like voices out here in the forest and the mountains. Most of the time it sounds like a voice and at best you might be able to make out a word, perhaps. But you have to be very, very careful when it sounds like someone is calling out your name. If you go in search of the owner of that voice, you won't be coming back. That's why you get so many missing person cases out in the elements. There's something out there and it wants to take you away. Well, my friend was shocked. He didn't really expect to get some kind of weird superstition, urban legend crash course while at work that day. And like I said, he's way too much of a serious guy to buy into any of that kind of thing. I think that's what caused him to respond in the way that he did. Where does it want to take me away then? I don't know. Why don't you reply if you're that interested or want to find out? Needless to say, my friend did not reply to the voice. The two of them ignored the voice as it continued to call for my friend. I think that day my friend opened his mind a little more to the unknown. It's a creepy world out there. I used to work security, and several years ago, I was assigned to a remote construction site where a summer camp was being built. It was quite literally in the middle of the woods, roughly four or five miles into the forest, with only a single access road they'd been using to haul equipment and supplies and such. My job was to provide overnight security doing a foot patrol of the entire area. The patrol covered two miles in all, roughly once every hour, and then go back to my post. A tiny wooden shack, not much bigger than a phone booth to fill up my logs. Other than the occasional black bear and coyotes, it was a very boring assignment, with one exception. I was doing a routine patrol one night near the end of my shift at around 3 a.m. or so. I just passed the gate where the access road enters the site when I heard an extremely loud and piercing scream that seemed to have come from some distance down the road. It sounded like a woman screaming in absolute terror, so I immediately took off sprinting as fast as I could in that direction. I didn't hear anything else after the initial scream, but about a quarter of a mile or so down the road, I came upon a car parked off just the side. There was no car in sight when I'd come through my way to make my shift. So it must have parked there fairly recently. It wasn't running, no lights were turned on, nor were any doors open. I called out to see if anyone was there to receive no answer, and looked around the general area, but didn't see a thing. Needless to say, I was pretty goddamn sketched out at this point. I ran back to my post, and reported what I'd seen and heard to the police since there really wasn't anything else I could do. Unfortunately, nothing ever really came of it. I never found out whose scream I heard or what caused it. The car was apparently owned by a guy who lived in the area, but I never heard why he was there. My supervisor suggested that maybe I'd heard a mountain lion or other animal screaming, but I've heard these sounds before. And although they're freaky, there's no mistaking an honest-to-goodness human scream. Mm. 
This happened to a friend of mine while he was attending some mountain climbing club. He and some friends in the club were set to meet up at, at a campsite before taking off on a local mountain hike. One of the members of his team was running late, so he waited at the campsite for him to show, but they were eating into their hiking time. His friend wasn't a bad climber at all. He was familiar with that particular mountain range, so naturally, the team were growing a little concerned by his lateness. They started to worry if something had happened to him. It wasn't until it got dark that he finally showed up to the campsite. Everyone was relieved, but had a collective question on their minds. Where the heck have you been? When that question was asked, the response the missing team member gave was nothing short of unusual. I set off early to meet you all here on time, but I ran into something I can't really explain. Did you guys pass a spot where there was a broken street light? It was kind of flickering on and off. Did, did you see that? He asked. The group agreed that they passed the broken light that he was talking about. Right, well, when I got close to that light, I saw something. Underneath that light, there was a figure of a woman wearing really dirty clothes. The team members exchanged glances of concern, and some even snickered. The late team member continued. Well, yeah, I mean, you wouldn't expect to see a woman out on the mountain trail that far in without any gear, you know? It caught me off guard. I didn't know what to do, so I just stopped and watched for a while, from a distance. And it was at that point that I realized something. The woman disappeared sometimes. I know, I know that makes no sense at all, but I don't mean it as a kind of analogy. I literally mean that she disappeared and then reappeared. Every time that light flickered on and off. When that light was on, she wasn't there. And when that light was off, she was. I couldn't make sense of what I was seeing. I looked at her from as many angles as I could to try and make sure I wasn't just seeing things. But I just didn't like what I was seeing. I thought that, you know, it could be a ghost or something, and there's no way in hell I'm tangling with the paranormal out in the middle of the woods. So I had a choice to make. Either pass her by underneath that flickering light, or go the long way around and be late, and now you know what choice I made. He explained himself with a look of disappointment on his face. Everyone seemed a little concerned. I guessed that they weren't sure what to believe. The way my friend tells this story makes it sound like, after a little while, they dismissed what he saw, and they just carried on with their night. Some of his friends made fun of him for using the paranormal as an excuse for being late. They berated him and said things like, what a lame excuse. He told me about that story six months ago, and I thought, yeah, cool, seems kind of creepy, but I didn't really think much more of it than that. I thought that it was all said and done with, and I kind of forgot all about it, so I was a little surprised when my friend mentioned it again this week. We met up to do a little mountain hiking of our own. I had actually gotten interested in mountain hiking and climbing during those six months that had just passed. Do you remember that story I told you about my mountain climbing friend and his lame excuse? The broken light one. Yeah, I replied. What about it? Is that why you were late? And he was late, by the way. It was annoying. No, no. I saw it too. I smiled and exhaled through my nose, expecting it to be a punchline to some lame joke he was trying to set up. The only thing was, his face didn't show any signs of humor. He wasn't kidding. And to be honest, he looked a little pale. We were in the same place that his friends said... He saw it. We were going on a hike in the same mountain course, so it did kind of make sense. He said that there was definitely a woman who appeared and disappeared on the mountain trail beneath a flickering streetlight, just like his friend has said. Like his friend too, he was way too scared to go anywhere near her. And he also described her appearance as shadowy and said that she was wearing filthy clothes. I have known my friend for years, and he has never came out with anything like this before. Yet I still don't know whether or not to believe him. I mean, is this just some kind of sorry I'm late excuse that mountain hikers use? Or is there really an apparition on that mountain trail? 
perhaps the spirit of some hiker who perished in the elements. Well, apparently two people have seen this woman. I don't know if there are others out there. The truth remains unknown, I guess. Hi, note from me, Jay here. Unfortunately, the author hasn't included the location of the mountain range, so I can't search for any other encounters, which is frustrating. I guess that the reason that some of these stories do this is to either encourage readers to come forward and say something like, oh, I saw that woman near Mount Gongan, and then they can have some kind of confirmation. Another reason why they might keep the locations anon is to dissuade people from going in search of what they saw and ruining the hiking area for others by maybe drinking a little, shining flashlights everywhere, making noise at night, etc. No comments on this one, either. Oh well, I hoped you enjoyed the image, at least, of a figure appearing and disappearing as the streetlight in the woods flickers at night. I was in the mountains of North Carolina for several days. It was beautiful and peaceful hiking with my brother and sister and their friend Caleb. Until one early morning at around 3 a.m. when every creature in a 10 mile radius was chirping, squeaking, howling, or scampering through the woods. Being from the Midwest and having survived two tornadoes, I thought the worst weather event of my life was about to occur, and there I was, sleeping in a hammock. For those of you who don't know, just before a tornado is formed above your head, every animal in sight will be out of there. They know. They can feel it. You can feel it too. You just won't know what you're feeling until the 60-year-old tree beside you is being ripped from the ground. Being in the eye of the tornado is even more strange as all those same animals are frozen. Sure, they still exist, but their little soul is on hold, and they don't do much more than just look around quietly. It's quite creepy. Anyway, this wasn't a tornado. 3 a.m., the fire we made was just embers, and a roaring thunder of animals freaking out. I peek my head out of the hammock, imagining getting my face smashed in, by the first softball-sized hail, with my luck, just for looking. But no, there was no bad weather. There was no storm or looming catastrophe. It was a beautiful night, aside from the roaring animal kingdom. My brother peeked his head out of the hammock above me and looked down to see if I was awake. When he saw my eyes as wide as saucers, he whispered, what the hell's happening? I replied, I don't know, but I wish I was up there in your hammock. Being on the ground level usually is best for guys my size, around 235 pounds. I lack the grace to climb up hammock ropes and jump into bed eight feet off the ground. The terrifying creepy roaring continued for about 30 seconds, and then it suddenly stopped. It seemed to be a sweeping effect. There was the outside of the radius, and it stopped first, and the creatures closer to us stopped last, but it was only a second or two difference. It was pretty damn synchronized. My brother and I freaked out. After five minutes of silence, we got out of the hammocks and started the fire again. This time we made sure it was big enough to light up a hundred feet out. The last thing we need is a Bigfoot or some weird stuff going down. My brother went to check up the ridge on my sister and Caleb, about 60 feet uphill from our hammocks. Caleb always wanted to be at the highest possible safe spot so he could watch the sunrise from his hammock. As soon as my brother got their hammocks, he yelled a shrieking kind of yell for me, the kind I had only heard twice before, when his friend got his bike handle lodged in his stomach about an inch deep, and when he split his own head open. I ran up the ridge with an axe in my hand, with first aid on my left, and flashlight in my teeth, expecting the worst. When I arrived to Caleb's bottom bunk, he was in a state of shock, 
eyes wide open, shivering and shaking as he was staring down the valley. Wouldn't you know, my sister didn't even wake up. She had her headphones in all light, listening to folk music. Apparently she hates the sounds of animals and preferred to have a controlled mental state. We woke her up and she had no idea what was going on. We eventually got Caleb down to the fire and wrapped him in some blankets. I gave him a shot of whiskey to sip on, but he mostly just held it and stared into the fire. The whole night was too weird for sleep. But then Caleb finally lay down next to the fire and fell asleep at around 5 a.m. The sun came up and my siblings and I decided to leave the fire and go see the sunrise from the ridge. We all sat in Caleb's hammock, still bewildered. The sun was perfect and Caleb picked out the best spot you could imagine. But then my brother spotted something strange. What's that? He said, pointing down the valley, right there on the bank of the river. My sister and I were struggling to get his perspective, but then finally noticed a clearing. We decided to go check it out, but one of us had to stay with Caleb and my sister volunteered as she hates creepy things. She didn't want us to go down, but we insisted. I left her my axe and emergency GPS signal device and told her to just scream if she needs us and to not hesitate to use her pepper spray. So my brother and I hiked down to the river. It took about 20 minutes, but when we arrived, we felt very uncomfortable. There were no animals around, no birds, no squirrels, nothing. The clearing on the riverbank was around a hundred yards upstream. We took to the higher side of the bank to keep our distance. I don't think either of us actually expected anything to go down, but we wanted to remain cautious. When we were around 50 yards away, at a slight elevation to the clearing, we pulled out our phones to take pictures, but our phones were dead. Mine is known to die, but I have an external battery pack that attaches to my Otterbox that I know was fully charged. My brother's phone was always reliable and usually he had his portable solar charger attached, but that was dead too. Both of us tried to hold our power buttons to no avail. It was about a hundred feet across the clearing and in the shape of a triangle. All of the bushes and plants that typically grew alongside the river were flattened down. Even some mature azalea bushes that typically stand at six to eight feet tall were eerily lying flat. It's as if something in a triangle shape had bent down as close to the ground as it could get, but nothing appeared broken, but rather as if it had grown along the earth instead of growing up towards the sun. When we got back to camp, Caleb was awake. My sister had a weird look on her face. Caleb was totally normal. Hey bro, you all right? My brother asked. Yeah, man, doing fine. Missed the sunrise, I guess. I needed the sleep. We looked at him concerned. He was eating a breakfast bar and heating up coffee. We sat down across from him and I asked, so uh, do you remember that stuff from last night? He looked puzzled. My brother added, you know when all the animals freaked out and we found you. He looked so confused. My sister said, Caleb, stop playing. But he asked what we were talking about. My brother said that he was so messed up last night and Caleb laughed and responded, yeah, I figured I had to be because I'd never slept next to the fire or wrapped up in blankets, not after getting that bug in my ear that one time. We continued to probe him, but he had no memory whatsoever. As far as he was concerned, he had too many drinks and slept next to the fire. We told him our story and each of us agreed, but he had no recollection. We told him about the spot next to the river and how our phones wouldn't turn on. We pulled our phones out to show him and they were already on. My brother had 67% and I had 41. That gave us the creeps real quick. We decided to pack up camp and get the hell away from that spot. But before we did a final sweep, Caleb asked if we'd seen his camera. He had a nice DSLR Sony with a very good lens, but it was gone. The weirdest part is that he slept with it in his hammock every single time he went camping and we'd never seen it not on his body. He even had specifically remembered taking it to bed and tucking it in his bag and putting the lens in its special sleeve. It's like a ritual for him. He takes very good care of his stuff. 
We searched around the ridge, all around the fire and in between the two spots. It was nowhere to be found. Caleb even went down the ridge a bit towards the river in case it had fallen out and rolled down the hill, but it was gone. We had to leave, and my siblings and I agreed to pitch in to buy him a new one if he would just get out of there. About three miles and an hour later, my brother turned to me on the trail and said, do you think he tried to take picture of something he wasn't supposed to see? And the creepiest feeling swept over me and I replied, bro, let's just forget how messed up that was and get the hell away from here. And he nodded in agreement. It's been a few years now and they haven't seen or heard from Caleb in at least eight months. No one has. This happened when my younger brother and I went out into the woods to catch bugs. It was summer and I believe I was in the fifth grade at the time. There's a mountain in my hometown. It wasn't very popular because it isn't an easy climb. Plus summer in Japan can be pretty harsh for even the most experienced hikers. The mountain range is pretty big but since my brother and I love to be outside, we felt as if we had exhausted our usual bug hunting locations on that day, I don't think we found much more than a couple of beetles and some bees. So I turned to my brother and I said, why don't we try and find a new spot? And with that, we went further into the mountainous woods, exploring. I remembered that there was a little trail off the beaten path that we hadn't checked out yet. So we headed a little ways up the mountain to check that out. In my hometown, the temperature during summer is usually 35 to 37 degrees, but sometimes it can reach close to 41 degrees. And of course, there is the humidity that comes with living close to a mountain range. So naturally, it was a really hot afternoon. We arrived at the trail off of the beaten track, and we headed off on it. As we got a little deeper into the brush, out away from the main trail, I noticed that there was something different. It was a lot colder. I felt as if I was in one of those walk-in freezers. Goosebumps were breaking out all over my body. It was the strangest thing. I had this intuition that this trail we were on was inherently dangerous. I wasn't fearful of running into a bear or even worried about getting injured on the terrain. I was worried about something I couldn't quite put my finger on, something older than I knew. I was, I was aware of this strange kind of feeling of apprehension, but it wasn't strong enough for me to turn back. I felt for sure that my brother and I would find some interesting bugs out there. We were always on the lookout for stag beetles, and that was what I was hoping for that day. We were going further and further away from the ways we knew, and heading deeper and deeper into uncharted territory. I was still not willing to turn back, but then I suddenly felt as if something was strange. There was something different about this part of the woods. I looked around and noticed that some of the trees were thick, but most of them were thinner than the usual trees on the mountain range. They were really thin. Their trunks were no thicker than about 20 centimeters or seven inches. Stranger still, but next to those thin trunks, were little altar looking things. I'm not just talking about a couple of these things next to these strange looking trees. I'm talking about dozens. It was seriously weird. The altar things were set up at different levels from the ground. By that I mean they were at different heights, but they all seemed to be made of stone. Another common theme was the fact that on each of these altars was wilted and dead flowers and small plates, which are commonly used for salt. Hi, Jay here. In Japan, morishio means piled salt. It is a traditional practice that has been handed down from one generation to another. It has been believed that the piled salt in a small dish placed by the front door works for purification of the premises and 
warding off evil spirits. You can usually see these nearby restaurants, so the reason that they might be appearing on the altars out in the woods might be to ward something evil off back to the story. I had seen things like this before. I mean it was the countryside, and traditions and beliefs seem to be held in greater respect here than in the big cities. I had seen it before, but not to the same extent. This felt a little much, a bit overkill, and even at a young age I could see that. Locals would sometimes set things up like this to commemorate deaths, to give people a place to reflect on who might have passed on in accidents, etc. It was usually just the one structure though, this was too much. Just when I was thinking about that, and I was growing more and more concerned, I noticed that my brother and I were no longer alone, off the beaten track. From behind one of those thinner trees appeared a grey figure of an old man. He was looking directly at me. I couldn't see him clearly, which made no sense as there wasn't much space for him to hide behind a tree that thin. Something was seriously wrong with the man, he didn't look real. I instinctively turned to my brother and said, we need to get out of here and fast. I could tell by the fearful look in his eyes he was thinking the same thoughts as me. Then, and this is the point where I feel like no one ever believes me, I saw dozens of these grey people appear behind those thin trees with the altars, young and old, male and female. They all just glared at my brother and I. We ran for it. I have never experienced anything quite as frightening as that in my life. We never went back to that part of the woods. But I did hear that my hometown was one of the areas that was heavily bombed in the war. Perhaps. Just perhaps that had something to do with what we saw that day. <laughs>